You all looking good today? You look summery. How many of you thankful for the summer? Yeah. A little vitamin D goes a long way, right, man? Hey, man, right? Come on, you awake? You must not have been in the sun. Right? How about the S-U-N, but the S-O-N? Oh, come on now. All right, good. Thank you. Hey, James chapter 3, we're in our series called Life Hacks. And uh, what we've been talking about is how little things in our lives can make a big difference. And uh, matter of fact, what I love about James is it's just so practical that it really talks about things that make us human. If you if you're here week one, we talked about temptation, right? And we all deal with temptation. We face it every single day. Being tempted is not a sin, by the way. But James gives us a, a practical approach to how do you overcome temptation? When the devil tries to take you out, how do you overcome him? And what he wants to try to do in your life. So James gives us some things to do. Last week we talked about, uh, it was a crazy Father's Day message. But we talked about favoritism. And how we should combat favoritism. How do we as the body of Christ address prejudice? Because it's a sin. It's not okay. It's wrong. And James talks about that and he tells us how do we overcome it. And today we're going to talk about something that we all struggle with. And uh, before I tell you what it is, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever lied before? Raise your hand. If you, yeah, okay, good. Have you ever talked bad about somebody before and you realize maybe you shouldn't have done that? Yeah. Have you ever said a word that you should not have said before? Like you stubbed your toe, stuck in traffic? Yeah. Um, So basically what we're going to talk about today is how all of us have a big mouth (laughs) and how it gets us in trouble from time to time. It's something small, it's something little, but it can cause a lot of big destruction and things in our life, right? So I got to tell on myself and it it just reminded me of the power of words and really what we're going to talk about today. A couple weeks ago we went and saw Lisa's family in Pennsylvania We haven't seen them in couple years. And so uh, Lila, you know, my niece's nephew, two nephews now, right? Niece, two nephews, they're younger. We were going to go to an amusement park, but they came down with the bacteria for scarlet fever. And they hadn't been treated yet. And so I had to sit down with us as a family and say, you know what? We were planning on going on this trip with them to this amusement park, but they're not treated yet. So we're not going to go with them. We, we can't do that. I'm not going to put my family in, in that kind of danger. And you can understand Lila. She's starting to cry. She's upset. She was planning on spending some time with her cousins and having fun at the park. So as a dad, I tried to sit her down and console her. And I tried to say, you know what? It's okay. I know you're upset. You're still going to see them. They're going to get on antibiotics. And then you'll be able to play with them still and hang out with them. But we're still going to go to the park as a family, and we're still going to have a good time. And then I'm trying to tell her, as a matter of fact, because you're older, I'm actually going to get to take you on some things that your little cousins couldn't go on. So you're going to have a good time. So the next day, her her uncle, my brother-in-law, stops over to give us some tickets to the amusement park. And he just starts talking about how, you know, it's unfortunate they couldn't go. They were really looking forward to this. And he was almost kind of apologizing. And my little daughter, who's eight years old, just kind of spoke up and said, Hey, Uncle Wayne, that's okay. My dad said we're going to have more fun without you. <laughs> now, just for the record, I did not say that. But having said that, I was reminded of the power of our words, right? And so look what James has to say. James chapter 3, starting in verse number 1, here's what he says. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. So pray for me, okay? Uh, We get up and joke and have fun, but, you know, I'm going to be judged by the words that come out of my mouth, okay? So words, again, James is saying is they're powerful. And he says, we all make many mistakes. And here's the example. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect 
and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue's a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. How many of you know this is true? But no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes we get it right, James says. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. And then sometimes we get it wrong. It curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. He says, surely, my brothers and sisters, that's not okay. This is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out of both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Wow. We have a big mouth. And so James really breaks this up into two things. One is he wants to remind us of, of, of the power of our words. Just to remember that. And then he tells us how do, you, how do you guard your mouth. So let's talk about this quickly. The tongue's powerful, isn't it? And James says, number one, the tongue has the power to direct. Has the power to direct. I don't know if you've thought about this, but it's really true. Our words have the ability to steer our life. You know, some of you maybe are in the profession that you are in because somebody spoke something over you. They saw something in your life and said, you know what, I see this in you. You would be great at this. And their words kind of steered your life and directed your life. Our words can direct us. And in case in point, have you ever talked yourself into doing something? Yeah. And we can even recall right now, sometimes we nailed it and we, we got it right. And then other times it's like, why did I listen to myself? I really got myself in trouble. But our words can direct us. But also remember, our words can direct others. Our words can affect the lives of people around us. And I love what Solomon writes. I want you to see this. Proverbs uh, chapter 18. The wisest man who ever lived. Here's what he says. He says, the tongue can bring death or life. And those who love to talk will reap the consequences. But really what I like about what Solomon writes there is he, he, he wants us to understand that whenever you have the ability to talk to somebody, enter into conversation, maybe respond to somebody, he says, understand, you have a choice. You have a choice. You can either speak life into somebody, speak life into a situation, or you can speak death into a situation or into a person. But he wants us to understand words direct us, and they can direct the people around us. And then I love this prayer that the psalmist prays in Psalm 141. It's really a simple prayer, but it's amazing. He says this to God. He says, Lord, take control of what I say and guard my lips. I, I think that's a great prayer. That's a noble prayer, isn't it? But then he says this in verse 4. Don't let me drift toward evil or take part in acts of wickedness. Don't let me share in the delicacies of those who do wrong. And really what the psalmist is saying here is, again, Lord, guard my mouth. Help me to watch what I say because... The words that I speak or the words that I allow people to speak over me, they can cause me to drift. They can cause me to drift from your best and from the life that you called me to live. They can cause me to drift from your presence. Words have the power to direct our lives. And some of us even, I like to say we have an epidemic today of self-fulfilling prophecies. Sometimes things happen in our life not because God's caused it. It's because of the way you talk about yourself. Amen. Or because of what you've allowed other people to say to you. Remember, words have the power to direct. 
And then James says this, the tongue has the power to destroy. Has the power to destroy. I like history. And it was amazing to me that in World War II, the War Department came out with the slogan for propaganda posters. And some of you may have heard this slogan before. It says this, loose lips sink ships. And really the reason they did that is because they wanted the American public to understand that there could be spies around. And anything they said could become useful information to the enemy. They wanted to remind the American public that words have the power to destroy. And that if you said something that you shouldn't say, your loved one who was serving our country could be put in harm's way. Because of information that you gave, right? And again, the Bible talks about this. Look at it. Psalm, or Proverbs 10 says this. I think we'd, we'd agree with this. Just nod your head if this is true. Too much talk leads to sin. Yeah? Ever happened to you? You said too much. Oops. <laughs> right? Here's good, here's good advice. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> right? That's what scripture says. It's, it's blunt sometimes, isn't it? But it's helpful. It's for our benefit. Why? Because words have the power to destroy. Uh, October 8th, 1871 was referred to as the night that America burned because there were two great fires that happened that night. The first one most of us have heard about in history and everything else. It was the Great Chicago Fire where millions of, of, uh, millions of dollars of damage occurred, 300 people lost their lives, and there was a lot of mystery and myth around how the fire started. I mean, some of you are thinking right now, wasn't it the cow that kicked over the lantern in the barn? Right? And, and so this fire in Chicago, it, it, it spread across the country. The headlines spread across the country. But on the very same night, there was also a fire that was known as the Forgotten Fire. Happened the very same night, October October 8, 1871. Matter of fact, it is the largest forest fire in United States history. And it happened in Peshtigo, Wisconsin. It's estimated that anywhere from 1,200 to 2,500 people lost their lives. More than in the Chicago fire. Not only that, but it's estimated that a billion trees were consumed. And some people speculate that the fire started by sparks that came from a passing train. What does James say about the tongue? He said the tongue, it's a spark that can set a great forest on fire. So just remember that words have power and our words can destroy. And then James says this, the tongue has the power to delight. Amen. It has the power to delight. I want you to think about what our words should do. Our words should bring joy and satisfaction to the people around us. Amen? Amen. Our, our words should be timely. Our words should be gracious. We should say, please. We should say, thank you. Our words should be respectful. Our words should honor people, right? Our words should be polite and kind. And respectful and caring. Our words should bring healing to people's lives. Our words should bless people. And encourage people. See James says your words have the power to delight people. And some of us are hanging on to a word that somebody said to us maybe a month ago. Or a year ago. Something that was just so thoughtful and so kind. Maybe they sent you a note. Maybe it was a text. But it just lifted your spirits and it brightened your day. Understand why. Because words are powerful. And so James says this. Because words are powerful, we have to guard our mouth. We have to watch what we say. And so I know the question. Because I'm with you. Okay, how do I do that? How do I guard my mouth? How can I watch what I say? Because I get it. I get myself in trouble by what I say. So what do I do about this? Okay? Now again, this is the practical side of Scripture. And what I love about Scripture is God's thoughts and, and ways are higher than our ways. Amen? I mean, there are things about God we're not going to understand. But yet, God cares about us so much 
that he really lays things out for us black and white. He says, I don't want you to misunderstand this. Understand, the practical is spiritual. Sometimes we don't think that. Sometimes we think something spiritual has to be something brand new that God just drops out of the sky. And I'm here to remind you the practical is powerful when you practice it in your life. And so James is going to give us a couple practical things that we can do. And I promise you this as your pastor. If you will do these things, your, your conversations will go better with your spouse. Your conversations will go better with your kids. Your conversations will go better with the people that are in your life. Because this works if you'll practice it. And here's the first thing. How do you guard your mouth? Pause. You pause. How many of you would agree that sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all? I think we should wait before we speak. And here's what wait stands for, okay? Why am I talking? <laughs> you wait before you speak. And again, I want you to see these questions because this would help us. Before you open your mouth, before you respond to somebody, before you say something, just ask yourself these questions, okay? Number one, is what I'm about to say true? Now let me just stop right there. A lot of our conversations would go no further. Because a lot of our conversations are based on hearsay, or what we think, or what we perceive. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a word out here in our, in our society today that fits number one, and it's this, fake news. Amen. If it's not true, and you can't back it up, and don't say it, right? Here's number two, is what I'm about to say necessary? Now again, words are powerful, but I also believe that timely words matter. So what we need to do is say the right thing at the right time. You can have good intentions, but if the timing is not right, instead of encouraging somebody or helping somebody, you can destroy them. So ask yourself, is what I'm about to say necessary? Is this a good time? If not, and here's the third thing. Is what I'm about to say helpful? Is this going to really help somebody? Is it going to benefit them? Is it really loving? If not, don't say it. Because again, James talks about this in chapter 1. Okay? He gives us this. Look at it with me. James chapter 1. He says this. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Everybody say pause and slow to get angry. Now again, that sounds simple, but I promise you this. If you do those three things in your relationships, they'll go a lot smoother. And, and understand what he's saying. Just listen, don't say anything, and don't get angry. How many of you would agree your relationships would be a lot better? Amen. Right? Amen. It's like, pff, isn't that a great idea? <laughs> Notice what else? Scripture says. Check it out with me. We got that. Proverbs 21. There we go. It says this. Watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. And you will stay out of trouble. And again, we can, we can laugh because I think we've all found ourselves in trouble before because we said something. That we shouldn't have said. And now it's coming back. Right? Proverbs 17 says this, a truly wise person uses few words. And then he goes on and says this. Here's a good example. When they keep silent with their mouth shut, they seem intelligent. Now he's talking about fools here. Here's what he says. Fools are thought wise when they keep their mouth silent. With their mouth shut, they seem unintelligent. <clears throat> Now there's a saying, I was trying to think about this, you, you might be able to put it in, in better words, but there was something along the lines of, it's better to be thought a fool and keep your mouth shut than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> right? Sometimes, just bite that thing, baby, and pause. Don't say anything. Okay? Proverbs 18 
says this, spouting off before listening to facts. And we do this a lot, right? We don't listen to the whole story. We'll just spout off. Here's what it says. It's both shameful and it's foolish. So everybody say pause. pause. Yeah, that's how you guard your mouth. You pause. Now here's the second way you guard your mouth. You ponder. You ponder. How many of you know that's a different word for think? Think before you speak. You're wise if you do that. I'm wise if I do that. Alright? Now, here's what I want you to understand though. We think in two areas. We think in two places. Number one, we think in our mind. We think with our minds. But we also think with our hearts. And that sounds confusing to us. It's like, say what, pastor? I think with my heart? Well, yeah. The Bible says this, and the Bible alludes to this, and I want to show you a couple scriptures that really talk about this idea of we think with our hearts, how we need to ponder. We associate this with the Christmas story. Remember the angel appears to Mary. You're, you're, you're highly favored, or you're chosen by God. I'm going to use you to bring the Savior, the Messiah, into the world. And I love what scripture says. It says, Mary kept all these things in her heart. Now the King James Version, I believe, says that Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And she thought often about them. We think with our hearts. You need more evidence? Okay, I'm with you. Luke 2.35. Look what Jesus says. He says, The deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Isn't that interesting? He, do, he doesn't say that, you know, what you think with your mind is going to be revealed. He says what you think with your heart, that's what's going to be revealed revealed. All right? Matthew chapter 9. Now, give you some background quickly. This is a story of where there was a paralyzed man lowered through the roof of a house and Jesus heals him and he forgives him of his sins and how the religious leaders were there that day watching this miracle unfold and they were upset because this miracle happened on the Sabbath day and they had rules about what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath day and so Jesus rebukes these religious people and notice what he says he says I know what you're thinking so get this he's saying I know what your thoughts are but I want you to understand where these thoughts are originating from so look what he says why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts. See you, you think we think with our mind. But really we think with our heart. And our mind just follows suit. Are, are you hearing me church? So now again it begins to make more sense. Because if you look at Matthew 15. Jesus says this. He says from the heart. Notice this. Not that you're sitting around meditating and thinking with your mind. And you're getting all these thoughts and gathering them in your mind. What you're going to do. Jesus blows that out of the water. He says from the heart. Come evil thoughts. Oh so my heart directs my thoughts. Yes. Right. Murder. Adultery. All sexual immorality. Theft. Lying. And slander. Where do they come from? Where do they originate from? The heart. Our hearts have the ability to think. And if you're like me, sometimes you want proof of this. And so what I love is that science is beginning to understand that we think with our hearts. Because they were doing some studies. I, I just found this out. They were doing some studies on people who received heart transplants. And they did this one study, it, it fascinated me that there was this little 8 year old girl who received the heart of a 10 year old girl who was murdered. And this little 8 year old girl began to have recurring dreams uh, of a murder that took place. And so the parents took this little girl to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, you know what, she's re remembering a real event. This, this event that she's dreaming, it actually happened. And so they contacted the police. And they sat down with this little eight-year-old girl and she gave them clues. She told them the place that it happened. She told them the murder weapon that was used. She told them the time that it happened. She told them the clothes that the murderer was wearing. And they were able to convict the murderer 
of this 10-year-old girl. Because our heart thinks. Listen to this. It's been proven that the heart sends information to the brain. And studies show that heart transplant recipients receive information through the donor's heart after it's become part of their body. In this same study, there was a 47-year-old man who used to love rock and roll music. Like the harder the better, the louder the better. And he received the heart of a teenage boy and he suddenly began to like classical music. <laughs> and it turns out that this teenage boy who died and donated his heart, he was a classical violinist. The studies have also proven that people with heart transplants, like their, their taste buds change. They all of a sudden start liking food that they never would eat before. And then they would find out that the person who died used to like that very same thing. See, our hearts have the ability to think. So, so let me give you a good piece of advice, okay? Instead of talking off the top of your head, how many of you have done that? All right? Instead of talking off the top of your head, how about we speak from the bottom of our heart? Amen. Because understand something. Our mouths are connected to our heart. Now again, it makes sense why the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart... The mouth speaks. So you know what you do to guard your mouth? You think. You ponder. Everybody say ponder. ponder. Alright, is this helpful? Now here's the last thing you do to guard your mouth. And, and I would admit, I think this is the last thing we think about. You pray. You want to guard your mouth? You want to watch what you say? Pray. Pray. How many of you think that rhymes? We could hashtag that, all right? Ready, hashtag that. To watch what you say, pray. And it's interesting to me, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is a, a prophet of God. He has this vision of the throne room of God. He has this vision of heaven. And some of us, were familiar with this story, but I want you to see it again quickly. It says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, now this is Isaiah, Isaiah saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Go on. We got the next one. There we go. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. The entire building was filled with smoke. What a vision, right? Then I said, now this is Isaiah, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I've seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips. And with it he said, See, this coal's touched your lips. Now your guilt's removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. That, that, that's a powerful account of somebody who was in God's presence. But here's the thing that I don't think we can overlook. All right? When Isaiah encountered the Lord, the first thing he was convicted of was his mouth. That was the first thing he was convicted of. My mouth is big and it gets me in trouble. I'm doomed. I'm in big trouble. I don't know how to overcome this thing. And I want you to understand something about the Lord. Okay? God in His presence is meant to be encountered. God wants you to encounter Him. See, what we're doing here, I want you to understand this. This is not religion. See, religion is cold. Religion is stale. Re religion is just all about things that you do. That's not what God's desire is for your life. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to encounter Him. He wants you to know that He is alive. 
That he has overcome the grave. That he is victorious. That you're not just going through the motions. Right? That you can encounter God. And see, we overlook this so many times. Okay? One of the ways you encounter God daily is through prayer. I mean, how can you encounter God if you never talk to him? How can you encounter God if you don't carve out some time in your day to say, God, I'm here to know you and I'm here to connect with you? Because understand what prayer does. Prayer gives us an opportunity to worship God. Did you know the Bible says that if we will not cry out and praise him, the rocks will? See, God deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. He deserves our adoration. And it's not just for the things that he's done for us, but it's more than that. It's for who he is. That he is God and there is no one like him. Amen. That he is king of kings and lord of lords. He's above everything. And he deserves our worship. He deserves our praise somebody. Amen. And we have an opportunity to do that when we pray. And then you know what else we have an opportunity to do? Confess our faults to God. Because you want to grow in your faith and you want to mature as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. Repentance needs to be a daily thing. Repentance needs to be, God, I've blown it. I've messed up here. I have, we don't want to call it this today, but I have sinned. And understand, we don't understand sin. We think it's breaking rules, and it's not necessarily that. What sin is, is breaking the heart of God. And when we understand that, we will change the way we live our life. When we understand, God, I have broken your heart. I have hurt your heart. And I repent of that. I am sorry for that. Will you forgive me? Prayer gives us an opportunity to do that. And then you know what else prayer gives us an opportunity to do? Say, God, touch my mouth. Touch my mouth. Because I want to tell you something. I, 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 ask, I, I dare you to practice this this week. Before you get up in the morning tomorrow and you talk to your spouse, before you talk to your kids, I want you to spend five minutes with God and say, God, touch my mouth. Before I ever say a word to anybody in this household, God, touch my mouth. Before you go to work and you have to do that business thing, you know what I'm talking about, before you have to make that presentation, before you have to sit in that staff meeting with your team, you pray this prayer, God, touch my mouth. Touch my mouth. Before you go to that sporting event, parents, pray, God, touch my mouth. Because when your kid doesn't get to play, you get upset. Oh, come on, I'm preaching today, and you're just looking at me like I'm from another planet. I'll preach to you guys. Right? Touch my mouth. Touch my mouth. And I pray this prayer almost every day. Right from Scripture, it says in Psalm 1914, it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, oh my, 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 be acceptable and pleasing.